Hey there, welcome to Studio 5. We've got a show to get you thinking this week. Mitch Album is here with a novel set during the Holocaust. We're also sitting down with a classical pianist whose journey includes a run for the White House. And we're taking a look at a film that imagines a conversation between Sigmund Freud and C.S. Lewis. Let's begin with Mitch Album. He is a musician, a journalist, and a best-selling author. His latest book is set during the Holocaust, and it is called The Little Liar. It is set during the war, but also layered with hope and forgiveness. Mitch, this is your, you've written many books, but this is your first book uh, set in the Holocaust, correct? That's right. What made you decide that now was the time and this was the book? Well, I wanted to write a book about the truth. I didn't want to write a book about the Holocaust. <clears throat> um, it just seemed that that setting was the best place to put it uh, because there was rarely a time in human history where the truth was more violated than during the Holocaust. Um, I had no idea when I started writing it two years ago that it would become as, as prescient as it, as it has turned out to be with the times that we're in, but it, it, it has. So where you're seeing or, or feel we're seeing a violation of truth even today? Well, I think we live in a time when everybody sort of picks their own truth. Unfortunately, we're living in a time where, uh, as it was a German officer who once said, a lie told once is easily seen as a lie but a lie repeated a thousand times becomes the truth. Take us inside the novel, if you will. We've got an 11 year old uh, named Nico who has lived a life of honesty until what happens? So it basically is sort of this epic love story of hope and faith and forgiveness. It starts with this 11 year old boy, as you've mentioned. Nico lives in Greece, never told a lie in his life. And there's a little girl, Fanny, who kind of loves him for his honesty. And when the Nazis invade, they find out about him and his reputation, and they decide to use him as a weapon. The trains are safe. We'll all be together. They're taking us to jobs. No, you are lying. They are taking us to die. So thinking that he's telling the truth and he wants to be back with his family, he does this for a few weeks. And on the very last day, he sees his family and that little girl being shoved inside these boxcars and he finds out that they're actually being sent off to Auschwitz and the concentration camps. And he realizes that the first lie of his life is going to be the worst lie he's ever told. I didn't know I was lying. The book follows him from that point forward for the next 40 years. Him, the little girl, his family, and the Nazi who tricked them, and the effects of that one lie on all of their lives. And how he spends the rest of his life trying to be forgiven for what he was tricked into doing and how the girl spends the rest of her life trying to find him to forgive him for what was done to him. What would you say about the importance of forgiveness on all fronts, the recipient, the giver? It's a really important question. I think that forgiveness is a two-part thing. We yearn to be forgiven. That's the obvious part. You know, we yearn to be forgiven for, please forgive me for my sins. Please, God, let you know, take away, I'm sorry for what I did. But there's also part of us that yearns to forgive. And that's the part we don't realize. We need to actually forgive other people or we hold that poison sort of inside of us. It's like a curved blade. We think we're sticking it into somebody else, but it's sticking in us. Uh, another theme that's prominent throughout your books and your life, uh, and I've uh, heard you share, um, is the need and importance of hope. How are you clinging to hope these days? <laughs> by my fingertips <laughs> it's uh it's not the easiest time to be hopeful there's a moment in the little liar where I, I was i was desperate to create this moment of hope even in the worst of circumstances and so the family in the concentration camp with all the horrors that go on during the day the grandfather insists every night that they gather together with their voices lowered so the guards don't hear them and they say one good thing that they that happened to them that day that they're grateful for that they're grateful to god for one good thing that like you imagine in a, a concentration camp what are you going to find so what do they say one of them says well i had an extra spoonful of soup thank you god for that one says well my rotted tooth fell out 
Thank you. You know, well, uh, the guard who always beats me wasn't on today. Uh, so thank you for that. Oh, I saw a bird. Thank you for that. And what makes us search for that one hopeful thing, even under the least hopeful of circumstances? That's the human spirit. That's the connection that we have with God. And um, I, I found it very important, especially in a book like this, to keep the thread of hope going along so that nobody gets depressed or, or sad, you know, until we get to the end when, when, when hope uh, wins, as it usually does. And The Little Liar is available right now wherever you purchase your reading material. A classically trained pianist, a transformational speaker, and a one-time candidate for the White House. I didn't wake up one day and suddenly decide to run for president. God had been planting um, some political seeds for a while now. Woke up January 1st and heard very clearly, run now, not later. Jade Simmons joins us in Studio 5 to talk politics and more importantly, purpose. Welcome back to Studio 5. Jade Simmons is a classical concert pianist, a transformational speaker, and an author. She's made a run for the White House, and she's joining us to talk a little bit of politics. But more importantly, she's talking about purpose. Oh, come on! Any blue fringe? That is up! Your uniqueness matters more than almost anything else. My purpose is no longer to play the piano. My purpose is to activate audiences into becoming the biggest, boldest version of themselves possible. The one they were always created to be. You were a presidential candidate in 2020. <laughs> yeah, so you just jumped right, you just jumped right in. Uh, listen, that's the biggest divine detour. I would not trade it in for the world. I learned so much about who God is, the potential of this nation, a spoiler alert, we are not who they show us to be on television. Mm. There really is not this divide that we think. When you talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, they all want so many of the same things. They all want to see a, a more human environment in the, in the way that we operate, and they want to treat each other well. So I believe this nation has incredible purpose, and I was honored, and, and maybe will still be honored in the future. Uh, that God has chosen to use me in that way to serve as a different voice, one that I hope pierced through some of the darkness of that season. Now, you've written a book mm -hmm. uh, called uh, Purpose the Remix. That's right. What inspired it? Did your purpose get remixed? What happened? It did. It <laughs> did. You know, my, my first book is called Audacious Prayers. Mm -hmm. And so and th there I was trying to get us to pray boldly, as big as the God we serve. But when I wrote Purpose the Remix, one of the things I realized is one of the recurring questions from people in all walks of life was, what is my purpose? And I feel like I'd lived the first half of my life believing my purpose was to play the piano. And the revelation that I believe God has been giving me over the years, and he did it first at the piano, was you are not these 88 keys. But what happens in my people in other people, he says, when you are doing the gift that I've given you or the skill that you've learned, that is purpose, that outbreak effect. So purpose, I believe, it's not something we have to go run out and discover. We don't have to go live in India for a year, eat, pray, love, right, eat any of those things. It's already been operating, and so our job is to look back and see what the wake is that we've been leaving uh, for our entire lives, and then pick that up and on purpose move forward. What's made it so difficult to find it? We've been told that it's hard, you ha it's elusive. So we sort of relegate purpose to the other person that's bigger than us. And I always say purpose is not bigger or smaller. It really is one size fits all. And when we talk about things like suicide and depression, you will almost always see a disconnect from purpose. If I have no reason for being here, what am I doing anyway? And if all the things I want or all the things I do are failing, what am I doing anyway? But I think waking up and realizing that just you being you, uh, the version that God has created you to be the biggest, boldest version possible, you showing up has an effect. And if we can reconnect to that outbreak effect, there's a connection there that's much harder to sever uh, than a vocation, an education, a skill, or a talent. I want to know what you would say specifically to black men mm. when it comes to dealing with our stuff. Well, 
When I first started working in the area of youth suicide prevention, and let me just do the disclaimer, right? I'm not a certified uh, psychological or mental health professional. I just was blessed to work in that arena for a few years. But there is a weight and a burden that I believe we as black people and black men especially have taken on. And that burden contains in it the very reality of our history as a people and then the very reality of what seems like the bleakness of our future. And I think for any of us to overcome that burden, we actually even have to, for as long as we can, step outside of the identity that comes from here and remember the identity that comes from there. There's something about remembering whose child you really are that reminds you you are not the fatherless child or the motherless child, but you have this eternal father who has made a path and gone before you and made all the crooked places straight. But to remember that we must not take on the burdens that others or society or history even tries to make us carry, but that we are free and freed to carve a new path. And it doesn't have to look like the ones that have come before us. Jade Simmons is a busy woman. You can keep up with her by checking out jadesimmons.com. We need to take a quick break right here, but before we do, we want to share a story and pictures for the week. Here's your Studio 5 snapshot. We take you to Beverly Hills and Sunday night's 81st Golden Globe Awards. Fashion was front and center for the stars of the past year's most popular film and television projects, with Oppenheimer, Succession, and The Bear winning big. But fans may be the biggest winning story of the glamorous evening. The Golden Globes audience was up 50% in the most watched ceremony since 2020. A look at all the glitz is this week's Studio 5 Snapshot. Still to come, an imagined meeting between Sigmund Freud and C.S. Lewis moves from the stage to the big screen. What drew me in for this was the idea in this world that's so polarized right now that two of the greatest minds would actually want willingly to come together and have this debate. The film's director takes a seat in Studio 5 for an up-close look at Freud's last session. Welcome back to Studio 5. An imagined meeting between Sigmund Freud and C.S. Lewis moves from stage to the big screen. It is called Freud's Last Session, where Freud invites Lewis to debate the existence of God. Professor Lewis. Dr. Freud. I've given you up for lost. The idea behind this film is that Freud invites C.S. Lewis to his house because C.S. Lewis was a devout atheist who embraced Freud's brand of atheism. And then one day, C.S. Lewis, he's just like, I believe that Jesus was the son of God. That was seen as a betrayal by Freud. And they have this friendly and respectful debate between them. Sort of intriguing, the script. Of course, watching this film, many people are going to be wondering, as I was wondering watching, did this really happen? I know, it's a, it's a funny thing. A ludicrous dream, an insidious lie. The whole thing started as a, um, as a class up at Harvard um, that was looking at atheism uh, from the point of view of Freud. Um, and the professor, Armin Nikolai, who eventually wrote a book called The Question of God, um, he, he, was, his, he was realizing he needed a counterpoint, so he brought in C.S. Lewis as the counterpoint. But in doing all, a lot of research, he found out that um, a young Don came, an Oxford Don came down to visit uh, right by, towards the end of his life. And I think he felt like all signs pointed to Lewis, but we don't know for sure. None of us know. We're all cowards before death. How would you describe this story? Yeah, it's, 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 for, well, what drew me in for this was the idea in this world that's so polarized right now that two of the greatest minds would actually want willingly to come together and have this debate. Why would you come here to see me if you disagree so passionately with my views? To make you realize that you're wrong. <laughs> that to me is the crux. The crux of the whole thing is the intellectual curiosity that somebody would actually want to hear an opposing side and have their ideas tested um, and be okay with that and be able to do it with respect. The wish that God doesn't exist can be just as powerful as the belief he does. Ah, good. 
what was it like to direct if you could qualify, quantify for us? What was it like? You know, it's, it's Anthony Hopkins and he's, you know, the idea of directing Anthony Hopkins is a very scary notion for somebody who's essentially done, you know, a couple of other films. So I, um, I was very uh, intimidated, but the thing was that when Anthony decided to join the film, he, he did it with such an open heart and, and he engaged so thoroughly, it didn't really give you an opportunity to sit there and stress out about it. You just, you just jumped right into the pool and um, engage because, you know, he, he brings everybody up to an a, their A game. Why is a work like this important in 2024? Everyone's in their tribes. Everyone is so um, locked into their positions. Loudest voices in the room just seem to dominate, you know, the internet and um, the, uh, the media. There's no communication. There's no, there's no place for people who live in the middle at all. You've insisted all your lives that the very concept of God is ludicrous. Yes. Clash between God and Satan. Ah, but I did not say whose side I was on. My hope was that, you know, it's a small film. It was an independent film, but I'm hoping it can reach a broader audience because I think that people are thirsting for debate. I, I think that people underestimate the audience's intelligence and their want of this kind of a film to be able to actually get up after the film and talk to one another and actually have a debate with respect. You know, they don't have to, we don't all have to agree all the time, but we can listen to another side. This is a film about tolerance in a lot of ways because it bears such striking parallels to what's going on in the world right now. Nobody compromises anymore. And that's the deadly part of our present society. In case you missed it, Freud's last session is available right now in theaters. Welcome back to Studio 5. As you know, music helps us to put this show together every week. And this week, it's Kurt Franklin and the family. They're doing a 30th anniversary take on their single that was a breakout success. Take a listen. Woke up this morning. Come on. I was feeling kind of down. I caught on my soul call. Yeah. I could not be found. I called on a, hey, hey, my life he can hold. Us. I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. Silver and gold. So hard to believe it is. 30 years old. On that musical note, we are just about out of time for this edition of Studio 5. So let's pause for a moment and look ahead to see what's coming up next week. She's the former co-host seen daily on CBN. It's the 700 Club. Delighted to have all of you with us today, and we're delighted to have Sheila Walsh, who's the new co-hostess. Speaker and author Sheila Walsh joins us in Studio 5 with words of wisdom for the new year. There's a difference between expecting something and living with expectancy because of someone and realizing that Christ has gone ahead and that every year I expect new things. And be sure and join us for that story and so much more come next week. Right now we've got time for just one more thing. We're gonna give the final word to Mitch Alba. When did you recognize the power of what you do and the power of words and writing and stories? Probably not until Tuesdays with Maury. And I was sitting at a book signing and a man came up to me and he could see he was very, uh, very sad. And uh, he said, my wife uh, died of cancer and the last thing we did was read your book together. Can I touch you? And he grabbed my arm and he started trembling. You know, and my arm was shaking, you know, and he started to cry. And he said, and then he let go. He said, thank you. It just made me, made me feel good to her. And I think that was the first time I realized that this is a very powerful medium that God has given me some ability in, you know, to be able to affect people. I, I have been given a, a responsibility and maybe a gift to be able to reach people uh, emotionally. And, and I need to take that seriously. Oh, Mitch Album, that is a great final word for this edition of Studio 5 and for this week's look at uplifting entertainment. Until next time, make time to uplift someone around you and then please come on back. See where Studio 5 takes you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching and Happy New Year.